Well, that was great. There was a lot of food for thought. And I think um, as Marcia's comments are fresh in my mind, I would like to start with you, if that's OK. Um, I'm really intrigued by your comment of economic development must be tied to sustainability, that sustainability isn't something that we should be um, perhaps striving for because it's something, it's something good to be doing, that we have to be very realistic and grounded. Um, and I'm wondering then what, how that might work into the idea of ecosystem services. So this idea that um, something about what Tommy was talking about earlier, that nature provides a lot of things for us for free that don't get calculated into um, the larger economics of the city. And so how might policy be able to address that portion of how biodiversity fits into ecosystem services? Um, I'm going to try. <laughs> um, let me start with, uh, well, let me make one point. Um, when I was talking about economic development and sustainability, in part what I was talking about were real, the reality of New York City. Uh, and New York City is a city that's about economic development, the drivers in, this, in, in, in city government. I mean, that, that's the driver in the city. And if you can't find a way to touch that major driver, unless you're really, really lucky, your issue is not going to get a lot of play. So that was part of what I was saying. But it, you know, it's interesting. The beginning to think about natural systems has come into play, for example, at the Department of Environmental Protection, DEP. You know, one of the major sort of cost centers in this city. You all know about your water rates going up. One of the reasons your water rates go up is that the cost of building gray infrastructure, you know, these massive wastewater treatment plants, which are required by law, um, those are very, very expensive. They're critical to have because you need to ensure the cleanliness of the water. Uh, but they're very, very expensive. And a lot of attention now, or at least some attention, is being turned by um, DEP to what they call green infrastructure. Uh, and how, in fact, through a host of, of methods, um, you can, for example, by the way you manage wastewater, I mean, uh, rainwater, um, so that you have more permeable surfaces, so that more water doesn't flow into uh, the waterways um, um, and become contaminated, uh, you know, when there's a, uh, you know, we have storm, we have a combined sewer overflows here. Um, so the degree to which water doesn't flow out and overwhelm the system, um, you don't have to build as much gray infrastructure. So I think these issues like the development of green infrastructure are an example how a better sensitivity and a utilization of that infrastructure reduces the cost of the city uh, and creates the conditions for spending money on other things. Oh, sure. You're absolutely correct on um, uh, the green infrastructure piece, but on a larger policy scale in terms of intergovernmental policy. Um, currently, the Department of Agriculture Forestry Service is really looking at trees as capital and preparing programs to, 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 for cities to really examine their trees, catalog their trees, um, make their trees uh, more available to, to real estate developers and so forth to really understand the value of these trees. And they do this for a couple of reasons, the economic development piece, but also because of storms and the damage that storms will do because of climate change um, to these properties. So, the property values are also calculated along with the trees. So there's a definite uh, economic value. And that economic value is now looking at being looked at by the federal government as something that all cities should look at. And there is a partnership between uh, Forestry Service and uh, New York State DEC, uh, Department of Environmental Conservation, and New York City Parks, and FEMA. So yeah. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
Um, but I think we're going to keep the rest of the questions and comments to the end, if that's OK. So, <clears throat> um, so, since, so since the commenter touched on this time, and I was hoping that you could talk a little bit more about the work that you've been doing with Million Trees. And um, I know that Million Trees was initially conceived of a way to address climate change, but you're certainly looking at it in a broader ecological context. So I hope you can talk more about that. Well, I think this goes to um, Marcia's point about there being indirect ways in which Plan YC is actually addressing biodiversity. And um, I've always kind of agreed with you that, the, but, but it would be great if biodiversity was much more front and center in the plan. And uh, I think there's some follow-up questions on thinking about it. What is the information transfer we need to do? I think the, the study is there to show the importance of biodiversity as a, a key element, that there's economic benefits to it. Um, but Part of Plan YC is Million Trees in YC, which is this plan to plant a million trees in the city by uh, 2017. And within that, as it trickles down uh, to the actual managers that are out there planting trees and trying to figure out you know, which contractors are going to water and uh, you know, whether they keep the trees alive in a, a drought in the summer, you know, part with, embedded in that is a goal by the actual people out there doing that work to increase biodiversity. So, that's you know one of the things that I'm working on is I work directly with the New York City Parks Department to try to figure out how do we increase biodiversity in the urban forest, and so there's there are ways in which uh, some of the sustainability goals of Plan YC are being um, are effective in the sense that we're, we're trying to increase biodiversity in the city. Now, one of the things we don't know is all the best practices for doing that. You know, the science in urban systems, as Mario introduced at the very beginning. It's actually very new. Urban ecology is a brand new field. And ecologists have, like myself early on, uh, you know, we preferred to go work in Patagonia in some place uh, where you can get nice calendar shots and sort of ignored cities for 150 years and have only recently realized, and I think this is hopefully catching on as a new trend, uh, that uh, because people live now predominantly in cities, that if we're going to make the planet better, we're going to have to start in cities. So, you know, that's one of the reasons why I'm working with the New York City Parks Department because I think it's a, important for researchers to be actively involved with the managers who are actually doing ecosystem management. And then the thing I've been pleasantly surprised by, maybe I shouldn't have been surprised by, I don't know if I have a negative view of the world or something, is that the, the New York City Parks Department it actually cares about biodiversity and they care about ecosystem functions and services and that they've committed themselves to adaptive management. Uh, and adaptive management is important too because that's something at least at the ground level uh, that says that as the science changes, they should be changing what they're doing. And so the nice thing is they're actively involved with researchers. That's not to say that we've solved all the problems. In fact, there's a lot of information that we still need to figure out how best to manage the systems. And I think going back to the, the points you were making, we need to figure out how to get some of the information that's been presented up here into the hands of policymakers. So, you know, going to the, to the comment you made about forests and the U.S. Forest Service, that bit of information got transferred. We now know trees have economic benefits, but what about the economic the benefits that are related to health? Are those being captured? We're starting to capture real estate, but, you know, how do we start getting this conversation about um, all the other ways in which we can measure economics? And is there anything else we can do besides economics as a value system? Is that the only currency you know, yeah. that's valuable? So anyway, I don't, I don't know if I answered your question. Okay. No. Yeah, that's great. Um, so then actually staying in this theme, Chris, I'd like to ask you about the idea of um, connecting humans to nature through the idea of biophilia and addressing um, human health. So some of the concerns that Samara brought up, I mean, what might be some opportunities that you would see, you know, if, if you had a client and endless amounts of money, I mean, what would be some things that you would like to be able to do in some of these neighborhoods to be able to address um, what Samara has pointed out as shortcomings? <clears throat> sure. I, well, I, what I found is um, it's a, it's a, for us, it's almost a one-to-one -one conversation with our clients and, and really communicating the ideas and the, the positive impacts that are, are present. And economics are, will always be an issue and, until we change the currency that we all live in. Um, 
but what we try to do is expand upon that. So it's not just economics, it's economics and health, it's economics and productivity. Um, and that tends to have resonance, and those, and health has an economic sort of side to it. Productivity has an economic benefit to it. So it's, it's all there, and it, it, you don't have to exclude economics to get your point across. You build biodiversity into the conversation of an economic conversation, in, in my opinion, and, and that's sort of after, you know, working in the green building space, that's been our, that's how we've been able to sort of push the market forward on sustainability in buildings, and developers are, you know, key, key economic drivers. Um, but I, and I think there's, there's a lot of things in the building state that we do. I mean, look at the natural daylight that we have in this space. You know, years ago, auditoriums were always in basements. They were always dark. But now we're building, like, this the best place to have an auditorium. It's just fantastic. Um, you know, it would be great to have a green roof out here, outside mm -hmm. the window we could look at. That'd be fun. Um, yeah, oh, well, there we go. We got a tree. That's good. Um, you know, access to really fresh air. I mean, I think, you know, a million trees is starting, you know, is going to help us with that. But how do we rethink how we, you know, the, the mechanical systems? I mean, every building, it's, a, it's an amazing thing that there are, Multi-million dollar apartments and affordable housing all have these terrible um, heating and cooling systems. You know, these through window air conditioners or through the wall air conditioners. They're terrible and they're unhealthy and they're just embarrassing. That in our, we build buildings with giant holes in them and it's considered appropriate. Um, and so that would be something I'd love to change. And I think, you know, luckily we actually have some amazing policy um, activities in city council that are moving t toward changing that through the Green of the Codes effort. And uh, we have a, you know, we've, we, we've made great strides under this administration around um, making green buildings uh, in particular uh, here f to stay for as a baseline for everybody so everyone gets them. It's no longer just people who can afford green buildings, it's building code. And we can always do better, but um, it's a, I think it's really moving in a, in a positive direction at this moment. But I think Marcia brought up a good point about 2013 and how we make sure that we don't lose a, that the momentum with a major administration change, which will lose a lot of intellectual equity when not just the mayor and the council people leave, but all the staff people that sort of they had brought in also get changed out, as all administrations do. Um, so think of those people who might be also the below the mayor and below the council people who are gonna help make sure, who are gonna get in there and help make sure that we get these policies move forward because they're very powerful. The, the names we don't know are, are very influential. That's great. Um, so Samara, you are wearing your professor hat here tonight. And one of the things that you mentioned in terms of in the classes and, and um, the review of the text that you use was that there pretty much is no mention of um, biodiversity or open space um, in the courses or texts that you're using. So what do you think are um, both, uh, if you could expand on some of the elements that you feel are missing, and then also what are opportunities then that you find where you're able to share your knowledge and the research that you've done with these planners to help expand their definition of what they're doing? That's a two-part question. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to be cast as a, as a person who saw a lot of criticisms uh, opposed. I, I, I see these as opportunities. Sure. So luckily I can work with students who also see these as opportunities. Um, what I would like to see is some of the uh, updates to the case books that are traditionally used be, have a greater focus on urban nature and biodiversity. We really can't live without it. And if you ask your students what role plants play in their lives, a lot of times they don't know. You can't be taking a drug that didn't come from a plant. <laughs> or, or, you know, they don't, under, they don't see the role or the importance of plants or biodiversity in our society. So, so if, if we do updates to textbooks or if we write 
the scholarly articles, then it would be great if they were also shared with a broad range of people, not just the usual cast of characters is another thing that I would like to see happen uh, in a perfect world. And how could, what was the second part again? Um, you had a good question. Oh, let's see. Um, well, what are some opportunities that you see in terms of using the knowledge that you've gained through the research you've done and I, expanding their roles? I think <laughs> the students always come to me with a question on their capstone. What can I do that hasn't been done? And, um, and one thing that has not really been done is look at the, do an analysis of the environmental quality benefits. We look at environmental burdens in EJ com communities. We never look at how environmental quality benefits. We don't look at the dollars. We don't look at the health uh, impacts. We don't, we don't know what the cost is when a wage earner dies of asthma in a, in a, in a poor community. We don't, we don't value those things. So we don't know. We don't even put the two things together, health and um, sustainability. So at the end of the day, people say, um, well, that's an energy issue. That doesn't have anything to do with health. Like, they, they could be teased apart. So yeah, I think there's lots of opportunity for us to do better by encouraging students to research areas that haven't been done and done and done and look at distribution of environmental quality benefits as something that's just as important as looking at distribution of environmental burdens. So uh, I'm going to ask you something, and I don't know if you'll want to answer it. But um, it's policy related. And just as someone who's involved with making policy, um, and I know Marcia has obviously touched upon this too in terms of education, but how do you think we can make the case for conservation at the city level um, in terms of talking to the mayor's office and the city council to recognize the importance of these issues? I mean, building on economic drivers is key, but it seems to me that there are also things where um, you know, the Bloomberg Initiative to um, have people no longer smoke in public parks, um, lower our, our salt intake, which is public health policy, and it's not, you know, there are certainly economics involved, but it's not a direct, it's not directly obvious. So I'm wondering if there might be some kind of correlate there um, as a way in, but just what your thoughts might be on that. Well. You can go online and see the statistics of the communities that are adversely impacted by uh, COPD and respiratory disease. It's mapped already. And <clears throat> but yet, when we talk to people, they don't connect those uh, issues. And I think what we, we need to do if we want to change the discussion is to um, reach out to the groups who are already working on health uh, issues and say, this is your issue. You should be also involved here. How many tree trees are going to mitigate the impacts for, of the adverse health impacts? So the, the, the people that you talked about in your studies, the, the communities who could benefit don't even know about the benefits that you described. Right. And, but there, are, there is a constituency of EJ groups, of people of color groups, that works on health issues, but they don't know that your issues uh, are intended to address their concerns. Right. Marcia, did you want to speak to that at all? So you're nodding yeah, your head vigorously. <laughs> Okay, that's okay. You can go off topic if you'd like to. Um, well, you know, I mean, I know my next question is slightly off topic, and this is also for you. So it, it occurs to me that, um, you know, political cycles and ecological cycles are not in sync. So politicians are much shorter lived than our natural cycles are. And so how do you 
suggest getting politicians to feel invested in these kinds of issues. I mean, certainly education, as you mentioned earlier, is key. But for, I think for a lot of um, politicians, you know, you either have a passion for it, as with other things, you have a passion for it and you're particularly interested in certain topics or you don't. And so how do you think this is something that we might be able to bring um, as really a, a force and issue to, um, to, to, to reckon with in the upcoming election? Um, you know, it's interesting. I'm not sure whether I believe it's important um, that uh, a politician or an elected official has a personal passion for the subject. Um, and frankly, I don't mind if this gets conveyed to the mayor. I have a feeling <laughs> the mayor, you know, is, is not Mr. Nature, never was, never will be. I mean, that's my guess. But frankly, I don't care because what he is is someone who was convinced that a sustainability agenda was in the best interest of the city of New York. So I want to answer this in sort of two ways. One, I, boy, am I on topic here uh, on this one. I, I, I really think you get people's attention, politicians' attention, by telling them, this is what I care about, and if you want my vote, you will embrace my agenda. I mean, I think it gets down to raw power and politics. So that's an important component. The other is to be flexible in the way you define your issues. And, and I use this example often. Um, you know, the League, um, not surprisingly, uh, you know, is a strong believer in climate science and, and uh, the challenges that climate change is creating for all of us. And the uh, guy who is now the town supervisor for Riverhead out on Long Island, a couple years ago sought the endorsement of my Long Island chapter. And he was very questioning of climate science. And for a host of reasons, he did not get the endorsement of that chapter. But I had a meeting with him about six months later. Because I believe you always talk to people you know, you talk to people who agree with you, you talk to people who don't agree with you, you always talk to people. And so I sat down with him and he said, you know, Marcia, I still, not really sure, but let me tell you something. I care a lot about energy efficiency because I think it's critical, you know, for Riverhead for a host of reasons. I'm very interested in renewables because I think there's an economic development component. Can we work together? And I said, absolutely, because frankly, from a very practical perspective for the guy who's the town supervisor of Riverhead, what really matters to me is does he move energy efficiency? Does he support renewables? What his idea is about the nature of, is almost irrelevant in that context. Um, so that's the other thing that I think people always have to keep in mind. I'm on the board of the National League of Conservation Voters and I, I have, fights with them all the time because their view is, well, you know, these people you just can't, they don't believe in climate science, so you just can't have a conversation with them. And I've said, you know, maybe you can. You have to figure out where, wh where do your interests intersect? So you ask and I went on. <laughs> no, but that's great. That's, that's really enlightening. Um, so thinking about those same issues, Let's see, time and I wanted to ask you something. I'm trying to think of what I should ask you. Um, you know, you and actually Chris both have um, resiliency that comes up in your work. And I'd like for you to, um, to expand upon that and just talk about um, what is the idea of re resiliency with regard to urban ecology? I think that's a really good question. <laughs> uh, it's a question, it's something I've been thinking about a lot and I've been writing about recently and there, there's a good reason for it is um, the discussion around sustainability I think has a couple problems. Um, one is that sustainability is not something we achieve in the short term uh, and so it's, it, you feel like a failure on a regular basis uh, and you know, I'm sure you know this, you know, there's all these things we keep trying to do and we, pe we piecemeal, we make progress and so the great thing about sustainability is it's a goal and we make all of these steps towards it. Um, one of the things it doesn't do overtly is it doesn't think about how we address certain kinds of challenges in the urban system. 
So um, climate change has been brought up, and uh, you know the expectations from climate change is we're going to get some shakeups in the system, right? Uh, the New York City panel on climate change has got pretty clear data from the best climate models that we have in the world that we're going to get a lot more heat in this city. That's not true everywhere in the world. <clears throat> it's going to be true in New York. It looks pretty likely. Um, I think the phrase is very likely. You know, it's the best scientists can do. <laughs> we can't give you 100 percent, but we can tell you very likely or extremely likely. Uh, it's extremely likely we're going to. It's going to get hotter. It's somewhat likely to, to maybe more likely that it's going to get wetter. Right. So these are things that we have to plan for, and we have to design our system to do a better job to handle with. And it also means that it's going to get, uh, we're going we're gonna to have more heat waves, and we're going to have you know, that, that snowstorm that we had uh, that, that Bloomberg got criticized for. I mean, I mean we're going to have a lot of those. You're going to get a lot of those kind of criticisms unless we develop a system to plan better for that. And resilience is about trying to understand how you design or improve a system so that it can adapt to those changes. Right. So uh, when we think about the city as a, as a system, as a very complex system, one of the most complex systems we have on Earth, really, are cities. They've got all these social components, all of these biophysical components. And if we want them to be resilient to the predicted coming changes, then I think we have to do business a little bit differently. And I think we have to take the conversation away from some of the things that are totally wonderful in the sustainability agenda but we need to think a little bit differently about this system. And there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of good research and information that has something to say about this, but we haven't, we haven't started talking in that way, and we haven't translated that information, I think, from you know, the sort of ivory tower of uh, academia, where some of the thinking is going, to the very practical planning uh, that's going on in the city. And that's something I want to work on. And it's, some, it's also why I brought up this um, idea of rethinking about the city as the connections between humans and nature as being part of a single system, as being part of what we call a social ecological system. And if we could reconceive the city as uh, being thought of as a biosphere, as something where humans are existing in this framework of nature, then we might think much, um, we might do a better job of planning more long term, which I think gets to this question Mario was asking you, which I don't know that there's a simple answer to, but we do have to figure this out, is how do we make good long-term plans with short-term political cycles um, and short-term you know, sort of economic benefits. That's something we still have to tease out, I think. So then, um, time in, I just want to ask you kind of a follow-up, too. Um, in thinking about a lot of the other things that have been brought up in your work with Million Trees, so, you know, again, the way Million Trees was conceived and uh, is being uh, implemented in neighborhoods is essentially that, you know, there are tree pits, some of them are pre-existing, some of them are new, a tree goes in and, you know, it gets watered, hopefully there's a neighborhood steward who takes care of it. But might there be something more that we could do um, in those, with those tree pits to better engage communities that might have more difficult access to natural areas, you know, the um, a lot of the outer borough natural natural areas that were set aside by Robert Moses are specifically around cars, mm -hmm. so access is a real issue. Mm -hmm. um, so, might there be something that we could do on a smaller scale, kind of bringing a lot of what you study and the ideas that we've been discussing into neighborhoods? Oh, I think there's tremendous potential there um, in terms of your comments for you know some of the some of the problems that we might highlight. That there's tremendous potential. Um, street trees are one of these places where I think they're, they've been undervalued in some communities. Uh, maybe it's because we don't know what the value mm -hmm. of those trees are, mm -hmm. and we need to communicate that better. I don't know if that's just the role of education. I think there's something probably broader going on there in terms of the ways in which we outreach for education and transferring that, that kind of knowledge about the value of street trees. But um, also thinking about street trees as particular nodes in, a, in an urban forest, uh, those are those are ways we could think about stringing them together and, uh, and the way in which we manage tree pits, since you bring it up at a very local level, to be corridors, to be connections between these sort of patches in the city that are where we have most of the biodiversity, right? Uh, and, but I also think there are places where you know, the, the really great opportunities for education. I mean, if you can use the tree as a way to connect people in nature, there's actually not, it's not just trees there. There's all sorts of insects and other things. You know, the, the soil is a living, uh, fabric there in the city. You can teach all sorts of things just by walking up t to a tree. And those are, 
the fact that we're putting more trees in more communities, I think it means that we're creating opportunity. We need, we need to realize that opportunity and do something about it, but those opportunities are, are going into communities in ways they haven't before, and I think that's um, something we can applaud, but it's unfinished business in a sense, right? Um, and we're going to be going to question and answers in a minute, but I just have one more question for Chris. So, Chris, I would like for you to talk about this more, too, from your, <clears throat> excuse me, from your unique perspective that, um, you know, in your work you talk a lot about resiliency as well and the idea of um, how, how might we be able to um, address the idea of, uh, of human health and community scale um, and something that Samara had mentioned earlier, the opportunity for people to be stewards. Um, how might that be brought more into, um, into the public design arena? Well, I mean, on resilience, we, I mean, a, lot of our, a lot of our work, we think, of, think about passive survivability. So if the power goes out, you know, can you still flush your toilet? Can you still live in your apartment for a couple of days? Like, how do, you know, we have to take care of people. Um, and how do buildings do that? And the reality is that actually nature is much more resilient to storms and um, major events than, than rigid, sort of engineered systems. And so it's just natural to sort of actually reconnect ourselves to those systems, or obvious to me, in order to create greater resilience. Um, you know, my personal belief is that if you want to change someone's mind about something, you have to connect them to the idea that you care about. So whether that's um, using urban agriculture and talking <coughs> about you know, the connection of, that we have to our food and that our food comes, you know, this tomato came off of this plant, and this plant came out of this garden, and this garden is a five-minute walk from your house, and that you know you can grow this, and then it's yours. I mean, it's amazing watching uh, young students grow something. Like you'd think they had, you know, they'd solved world hunger because they had a tomato in their hand after a, a, a summer class around gardening, but they're it's transformative. Um, we just planted a small garden on our roof, and you know, people just, they're like amazed that there are actually green tomatoes on the tomato plant right now. And I'm sure they've seen tomato plants before, but I mean, these are 30-something-year-old <laughs> people, professionals, who are acting like seven-year-olds. Um, so, but that's the genius of it all. It's really not that complicated. The hard part is finally time, right? I mean, we live in a, a world that is, you know, obsessed with, you know, blackberries and Twitter and time and everything else, and we pack everything in. But um, I find that you know, you, that's the way to really get people to realize. And so giving people access to the waterfront, creating pocket <clears throat> parks. And so people walk past it, and one day they just sort of you know, decide to sit down on the bench and, and spend some time there. And then they're, they can't imagine what their neighborhood was like without it. And I think that's the trans. That's it's subtle. Sometimes it's it, people don't even realize it even happens, and sometimes it's more of a you know revelation. But I think we just gotta we have to work to support the parks department and help them grow parks in our city. Um, they're a great partner, and they really want to do it. So, uh, and then there's actually a lot of people who really care a lot about parks all over the city, uh, and and so that's I think a really important part, as well as our waterways, definitely. That's great, thank you so much. So um, we're opening up the floor to questions. We have two mics on either side of the room, so feel free to c go to whichever is closer to you to ask us some questions. Well, I just yes. wanted to make a comment. Um, the whole health <clears throat> and environment aspect or the built environment aspect it's currently being addressed. Um, a new program uh, through the city, and we strongly encourage architects to really be involved in this, is called Active Design. And you can reach this through nyc.gov slash ADG, which gives you the Active Design guidelines. And Active Design is a partnership between planning, um, design and construction, uh, transportation, and of course the Department of Health. And their premise is that the built environment, as you guys are talking about, really should 
be designed to promote health. Um, they go back in history to the early 1900s where in lower Manhattan there were nothing but tenements and disease and cholera, you know, all kind of things. Thus, the Department of Sanitation was created. They tore down all of those buildings. They made new things. They created Central Park for open space and so forth. Today, we want to redesign the built environment or new structures to promote walking upstairs, to promote healthy activities, to design streets where more mobility is, 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 is allowed. Um, one thing that I'm really happy with that we are looking to implement in Harlem um, next year is t uh, uh, tenement buildings. Their old design usually lends to huge basements that really go unused. Um, new code has been designed through health, uh, HPD, and buildings to put in uh, exercise centers and, and children's play areas and so forth. So health is really being looked at through the active design policy. So it's a great guideline. I, I really believe and am amazed that, you know, how the city has championed the, uh, the issues. It's great. I actually wanted to ask if you would share your affiliation. I'm, I'm with the local development. Oh, great. Thank you. Okay. I wanted to uh, inquire with Marsha on the uh, Riverhead guy. Um, you know, you put it as if there were two opposite ways of dealing with politicians like that. Either you're, you're not going to work with them or you're going to work with them and find areas of common ground and ignore the climate issue that he doesn't seem to understand. So you see there's a third way uh, where you, you've sort of missed an educational opportunity. He has, not too far from him, uh, State University at Stony Brook, where uh, there are climate scientists who I'm sure, I mean, there were, the climate, so I'm a scientist, I'm not a climate scientist, but I know the climate scientists are um, con very concerned that their science is being misunderstood misinterpreted, totally mistaken by, you know, a, a fraction of the politicians. And, um, you know, if, if the guy in Riverhead is getting his views from Fox News or whoever, Rush Limbaugh or whatever, you know, he needs to hear from the scientists. And there are a lot of scientists who would be happy to talk with him. And I think there must be some at Stony Brook. And so, you know, it's not it's a, you, you make a, I'm sorry, did yeah, I? No, I'm done. You, you make an excellent point. And I, I do think that any occasion you have uh, for education, you should use. I'm just approaching this uh, in, a, in a strictly sort of pragmatic sense that uh, from my perspective, what I'm most interested in for the well-being of people in Riverhead is that they have an aggressive energy efficiency and renewable program, which I believe contributes in a positive way to dealing with the climate issue, but you're absolutely right. You should always use an occasion to educate people further. Thank you. Hi. Good evening. Thank you. It's a wonderful panel. Really appreciate it. <clears throat> My name is Ashwini Vasisht. I'm a professor at Ramapo College, and I direct the master's program in sustainability studies. I'm new to this bioregion, so this is a genuine question that I have. I spent 18 years before this in Southern California, and a lot of my work in urban ecology is centered around my experiences in Southern California, where endangered species are a big part of the landscape. And we look at habitat conservation plans as a fact of life. And what I'm trying to figure out here, in the case of Manhattan, New York City, are endangered species enough of a factor to be able to evoke the Endangered Species Act and habitat conservation planning and natural communities conservation planning and those kinds of models to create a discourse that goes beyond a million trees to doing revegetation of the city, doing native vegetation, things like that. 
looking at me? Uh, whoever uh, wants to take that. You're looking at me? Can I just say something? I think Samara is yeah. the right person. I just question. want to say something about the Endangered Species Act or our, or our existing programs to protect um, threatened and, and rare species. Um, most of the time at the federal level, it's, it's all on private lands. New York City doesn't have any protection for endangered species on private land, so we have about a thousand acres of wetlands that could have likely to have endangered species, places like Staten Island, where if you're the, the owner of the property, you could come in with a backhoe and like kill the bog turtle, no problem, because it's not protected. So, <clears throat> so and the Federal Endangered Species Act typically uh, works by encouraging voluntary conservation, and we could we could do something by encouraging voluntary conservation. But the Endangered Species Act, for for the most part, is not um, does not play a big role. We we do have um, uh, Mary will tell you uh, rare and endangered species in New York that are protected in parks, but if it's in, in private land, it's not protected, and so that is, I see that as an opportunity for doing something better than what's being done now. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Elena Hurkaggio. I work for uh, the Center for Environmental Research and Conservation. It's part of the Earth Institute. I had a question regarding, I guess mainly towards Chris, but maybe a little bit towards all of you. Um, within Plan YC and within the Bloomberg administration, I know there's been a, a big push for retrofitting buildings to make them greener and, and to, for new buildings to have, to have a better building code as far as, you know, going toward LEED certification. I worked in a LEED platinum building out in California, so I know the benefits that, that exist. What do you see as far as, as, far as policy-wise to, to push greening of buildings in, in the private sector. Is there, is, is there a way to, to manage that effectively without just relying on the economics of business and, and you know, the greenwashing, et cetera, within the private sector to really, to really push the greening of, of buildings? Well, if you take a look at the Green Codes Task Force that the Urban Green Council uh, completed with about 200 volunteer professionals about a year and a half ago, including some people in this room, or that were in this room actually. Um, that was, that's actually going to change the building code for all buildings. So it's not just for public buildings, it's actually the baseline code that everything within a certain building type, whether it's residential, commercial, different codes for different types of buildings, um, have to comply with. And a lot of the conversation is around protecting our infrastructure. So water efficiency, the conversation is around our, storm, our combined storm sewer and our wastewater treatment plants and how expensive they are to operate and build. Um, it's a, you know, it, it answers itself and we don't need to use water the way we use it. We use it because we, in the past, we didn't think about it. So it's really being, you know, taking what we know now and trying to apply it and then as that evolves, continuing to apply it. You know, it's a sort of a state of dynamic equilibrium. We're always learning something that's gonna throw us off. Even once we think we've gotten somewhere, there's always the next level to go. And, um, you know, it, I think it, you, you can't ignore the economics. And I, and I know it's frustrating to keep hearing that, but reality is you can actually use the economics in your favor if you take the time to understand it. So talking about a 1% productivity gain to a corporate building owner, um, means a whole, it's 10 times more valuable to him than a 10% a gain in energy efficiency of his building. But those, they actually might be the exact same strategy. So it's just positioning. And does it matter if you have to position, you know, to get them to listen, how you communicate, you have to communicate in, in their language and the things that they care about and that benefit all of us. So um, I, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazingly complex argument, but the rules are getting clearer and people are getting more savvy every day around the topic. So. Thank you. Sure. Yasser. Hi, uh, my name's Yasser. I have a small little software company that's co-owned by National Geographic to help people learn about local wildlife and preserve biodiversity. Timon, you talked about how ecology is a slow process. We're still kind of establishing best practices moving forward. Samara, you talked about how the research you did 10 years ago looking towards today not much has changed. We talk about Plan NYC, 
million trees. It's a 25 year uh, project looking forward. I understand the importance and the value of you know, looking into the future and tackling things at a policy level, but I was wondering if there are more things from your perspective that we can kind of do today on an individual uh, a basis. You know, things like, you know, the million trees is a great, great idea. Um, the whole movement around guerrilla gardening and seed bombing, things like that. Are there other things that you guys see that we can do today? You want to start? Uh, well, <clears throat> uh, I do think that there are opportunities for us to, um, right now, we don't encourage private owners with things that we can give away for free, like easements to, uh, we can incur, for example, the same developer that I just described a little while ago, and of course if you can't give away because you have budget problems so you, have, you can't give away any money, but what you can do is give away expedited approvals of subdivisions. It would be great, I would love to see us take these, some of these endangered animals and move them to parks. Now it may not be the best thing for society, but it beats death. So <laughs> it does. I'm sorry. Um, if the, if children grow up and they don't see the bog turtle, that's worse than seeing it in a, you know the uh, Staten Island Center. So I think that we haven't done enough job work in going in um, other places than the the uh, traditional to look at what's there and map that. And then we can make an argument why you shouldn't pave it over, change it. So there's, I think there's, there's more work to be done. I realize lots of times it's not paid work or anything like that, but, <laughs> but if we could get our students to volunteer <laughs> and then give them credit, that would be a way to get a cadre of people to come help your company map things, then we could give them credit and we could then have something to say, this is what we have to preserve. This is the way I would look at it. Did you? Go ahead. Go ahead. You go first. I think there's a lot of things that you can do. Uh, I think we could probably pull everyone in this room and everyone um, hopefully would have at least one good idea and probably, probably 20. Um, so I'll just simplify it and say, I think we need to work uh, harder in, in all of these maybe creative ideas uh, about how to do that to reach the younger generation. I think it's actually really important to connect people to nature at as young an age as possible so that those experiences sort of build on themselves. And uh, uh, there's, I'm, and I'm thinking about knowledge transfer, right, and, and environmental education. And I think there's a lot of missed opportunities in environmental education. So uh, one example, uh, and this kind of, there's a couple things that I think tie this all together. One is we're getting back to this discussion about the connections between humans and nature, right, and how, how to do that. And, and the other is that I think when we start understanding the complexity of the city as a system and the way in which humans do or don't connect to nature on a daily basis, there's a lot of ups and downs in that, and those ups and downs are opportunities, right? So following September 11th, New York City changed, right? And uh, in 2001, and there was the, the system changed, and there was a lot of opportunities for environmental education that were missed there. Those are very natural. There's a lot of evidence showing this now. Um, you look at uh, research going on um, in post-Katrina New Orleans, that there, people have a very their their biophilic response is stronger following a major upheaval or disaster or some major disturbance to the system. That's an opportunity for environmental education that we're missing, whether it's young people or or some other age group. That I think we can do. We can, we can find ways to capitalize on those maybe terrible events and turn them into opportunities to transform the city. So I would actually argue, and I, I think someday we'll have the data to really show this in a robust way, that one of the major changes that happened after September 11th is that New Yorkers invested in their nature. Now, it's coming through Plan YC, it's coming through a Million Trees, it's coming through things that are led by policy and they're led by economic incentives but they're being voted in. People are voting for these people because there's, there's a kind of response when you, re, when you want to rebuild the system around yourself that includes nature. I don't think we know that. I don't think it's a conscious thing. It's happening. But I think we can, we can encourage that by reaching out to people at younger and younger ages. And, and there's, like I said, a long list of ways we might do that are more practical. Thanks for the question, though. Mercy, did you want to respond? Yeah, okay. Hello. 
Hi. Hi. Um, it was mentioned that there are a lot of backyards in the outer boroughs, and um, certainly there are a lot of terraces and rooftops in Manhattan as well. Um, so when we consider using native plants in those spaces, I'm wondering where is the everyday person, residential um, homeowner going to find native plants? Um, they're usually not at Home Depot or uh, the corner deli. Um, I work as a landscape designer, and um, some, today someone said, oh, I really like this azalea. I'm going to go get another. And I was like, good luck. I don't know where you're going to find rhododendron, atlanticum, you know, around here. Uh, so, you know, you either have to go to Long Island pretty far or order online. Um, so I'm wondering if maybe the city could develop some kind of policy to forming a native plant nursery in a more accessible area outside of um, Staten Island or Long <laughs> Island, but somewhere actually in Manhattan where property value is quite high and <laughs> creating a nursery is probably quite difficult, but I think it's something that needs to be done if we're going to take a lot of what we're talking about seriously and have it more accessible. Rooftops. You know that though, right? I do know that. I have to say, it's really annoying to work on a rooftop with a nursery situation. Probably people who grow food on rooftops have experienced this as well. Just the going up and down constantly, you know? Yep. Um, but if there are freight elevators that go to the roof, that, that helps. But then also, unfortunately, vehicles are also part of the, it's just, it's, um, there's a lot of logistical things that would have to be worked out to it. I, I understand it's definitely an option. Um, yeah. It's a good question, though. And, and yes, rooftops are annoying places to work. But that, I mean, if you're actually trying to think about a native plant center in Manhattan, we're going to have to be creative like that. Actually, um, I could speak to that a little bit. Um, when I was still working for parks, um, I was working with the Greenbelt Native Plant Nursery. And for those of you that don't know, there's a 13-acre um, native plant nursery that's part of the City Parks Department. It's the only municipally owned native plant nursery in the country. Um, and it is on Victory Boulevard in Staten Island. It's definitely difficult to get to. Um, but what they do is uh, collect seed from within the five boroughs for species that are extirpated locally. They go very locally to collect seed, Long Island, New Jersey, Westchester County. Um, and these people are my friends. So uh, when I was still working as a botanist in, for the Parks Department, you know, we would get together and just talk about, you know, what, what kind of schemes could we come up with. And one we came up with that we impl implemented in 2006 was um, selling native plants at the Union Square Green Market. And this is not obviously, you know, the answer to your prayers, Marnie, but, but, I, but I think there's just a recognition that, you know, this comes up all the time, um, especially when I do talks around gardening with natives, where do I get them? And it's really difficult. And, uh, but this was one solution where um, I went back and forth a lot with my big green parks truck to collect plants from Staten Island and bring them into Union Square. And we worked with Oak Grove Farms and they would take the small plugs back to their farm, grow them out into larger pots, and then sell them um, at the farmer's market. And it went really well, but there were just a lot of logistical issues that we had to work out, and we only did it the one year. But it's something that um, I've been speaking to Ed Toth about recently, and we're trying to think of ways that we might be able to work with a few different nurseries. Um, so perhaps Gowanus Nursery, which is always uh, a good place to go in the city. Um, I mean, not for you, as you know, but just for the average homeowner who might want a plant or two that's native. Um, but, you know, that's a really good question. Again, and it's an opportunity. Where do we, you know, where do we start filling in these really big blanks that are, that are keeping us from reaching our goals? Um, oh, one more question? Thank you. Yeah, sure. my name is uh, Jason Alosio. I'm a PhD candidate at Fordham University. Uh, and, and um, Tom, you, you were speaking, hi, Tom. Uh, you, were, you were speaking about um, trees being kind of the connectors between green spaces. And we just brought up 
uh, green roofs, uh, and they could potentially serve as habitat patches, framing a patch network between green spaces. And I wondered if the panel could uh, just talk a little bit about um, biodiversity on green roofs and how that might play an important role in both stormwater management and biodiversity within our urban ecosystem, which is a heterogeneous ecosystem and different areas uh, need to be looked at in different ways because across the urban environment we have different challenges in different areas specifically that need to be addressed in different ways. So even policy that's um, implemented citywide uh, maybe needs to be looked at uh, through a more uh, local lens. So I, I was hoping that you guys could comment on that. Thank you. Well, we need legislation to address just plain straight vegetative green green roofs. We have rooftop gardens. We have folks that got permitted. And I heard the discussion about green roofs, and I agree with it. But one portion of the green roof piece that didn't really, I don't know if people really uh, talk about it, is that green roofs can keep your house warmer in the winter. Now, a lot of people in New York spend thousands and thousands of dollars heating their houses and they don't want it escaping, so we, we, need, we need that a piece to fall into place. And I'm not saying the city council should do anything, <laughs> but, but, it, but it's, it, that piece needs to happen. And then once we can do that, if there's access to the roof, then we should try to focus as much as we can on putting native plants there. So it will be a learning process to acquire them, definitely challenge and learn about them, but it would be so great if we did that and then we would both save fossil fuel costs that are lost if the, you just have a white roof and it escapes. But we could also increase the seed distribution of these native, because once they get, they go to seed, then they'll spread and spread in places that maybe you hadn't anticipated. I'll, I'll just comment uh, quickly. I think it's a good question to end on because uh, it goes to the heart of some of the, dis the issues we were discussing. Uh, biodiversity doesn't have the cachet of energy efficiency or climate change, right? Um, we're not championing green roofs in the city. Maybe you can help explain to me uh, why from a political perspective, but from an economic perspective, they're much more expensive than painting roofs white. I mean, it's really simple economics from that perspective. But we're missing economics in the larger discussion. We're missing the benefits of biodiversity. We're missing all the health benefits. We're missing all of these things that, you know, if you're up there on your, you know, inconvenient uh, rooftop, but gardening and getting the, the joy of a tomato plant or uh, watching pollinators at work, you know, th those economics aren't really factored in. So if you do a very simple analysis, let's paint our roofs white, it's more reflective, we get some energy efficiency gains. But I think we actually have a really amazing missed opportunity that you're bringing up that I totally would like to see champion in this city. And I think it takes a little bit longer term view uh, than we currently have. And I think it takes a broader, more in-depth economic analysis to show that. And we don't have that yet, uh, really, either. And green roofs really could be a major connection between these patches in the city. And I think if you, if you think like an ecologist, you know, uh, this is kind of a buzzword, but there's what we call metapopulations in the city. And what it means is that there are these patches, and if they're not connected, the patches can die, right? Mm -hmm. If we connect them, they have a much higher likelihood of living and fostering and in increasing biodiversity, but we don't have a lot of connections. Green roofs are our opportunity in a dense city like this, and I think we need to take advantage of that. Great, well please join me in thanking our panel. Um, yes. This has been really exciting for me. I've been dreaming of doing a panel like this for a long time. So thank you so much, for Michael, for allowing us to do this. Um, and SPN likes to mobilize their members, so I would like to mobilize all of you. Given our discussions, I'd like for you to all go home and do two things. Number one, talk to your elected officials about nature in New York City. 
And number two, before the end of October, so sometime during the growing season, because I'm a botanist, you have to go out and look at plants. Grab a field guide, find the nature near you, and get to know your foliar neighbors. Thank you so much for coming out. And uh, sorry, I'm just picking to keep you guys just for one more moment and thanking again the panel and Marielle and just the way I'm on the board of Sustainability Practice Network. And just this is our last panel for the season, but we are working on programming for the fall and for the spring. And the way like tonight's panel happened was Marielle walked up to one of us and said, hey, I would really like to do this topic. Do you think people would be interested? And we said, great, because... There's a lot of people who I don't know and don't have access to necessarily who are on this panel who are really interesting. Even if I get emails sometimes from Marcia, I get to finally see what she looks like. It's great. But um, so I think I really welcome there. I know there's a lot of you who are activists and advocates for different issues around sustainability with different backgrounds, whether you're coming from Southern California, whether you're an economist who have things that you'd like to see more highlighted. And we really encourage you to approach us or send us an email from the listserv and say, hey, I'd really like to see a panel next year on, uh, you know, I work on apps for iPhone. I want to really see a, a big uh, panel on all the different green apps there are that are coming out or whatever it is. And we'll help you put it together, but just uh, encourage you to get involved and you know, to be active, and then you can maybe spearhead a panel like Marielle and have your dreams come true. <laughs> Anyhow, thank you. Thank you for coming. Yeah.